Hey, so mates, plenty to discuss on this Tuesday. I want to welcome you back to Fox Hills Black Report. We're following the latest from a Minnesota school that's excluding students from a certain program and how researchers say racism ties into Alzheimer's. I'm Courtney Hicks. And I'm Nicole Delay Corte. Plus, how the writer's strike is impacting black creatives and the soccer player who's committed to fighting racism. They're the stories that impact our people. We're bringing you our news, our views, and our voice. So, topping our news today in a horrifying case, the family of LaShawn Thompson, who died in a bed bug infested cell at Fulton County Jail, has released the results of an independent autopsy demanding justice. Thompson, 35, died uh, in September of 2022 after spending three months in the Atlanta jail, now unable to pay his $2,500 bail for a misdemeanor charge. He was found dead in a cell covered with bugs, disturbing photos went viral in April. The independent autopsy, partly funded by Colin Kaepernick, confirmed neglect as the cause of death. Thompson's family is now planning a civil lawsuit. The jail has faced ongoing issues with the sheriff accepting resignations and promising upgrades. Well, I mean, first of all, you know, shout out to Colin Kaepernick mm -hmm. for creating an initiative to support these families uh, to allow for this independent autopsy to even take place in the first place. That's right. What a major difference this has made in that case already. Uh, but this is just also another stunning reminder that this brother was being held in jail because he couldn't afford to pay $2,500 bail. And there are lots of folks from our families, from our communities that are locked up in conditions that are like this, uh, I can hardly even begin to, to think uh, maybe even worse than this, mm -hmm. for you know the mere fact that they can't afford to pay bail. Yeah. $2,500 bail, and he lost his life in you know several months. Over a misdemeanor, over a misdemeanor. Now, now this is just one case. Can you imagine the families who may not have gotten the help or did not understand how to go about voicing their concerns and demanding justice? Uh, can you imagine if those uh, prison cells are still in the same conditions as now they've been reported to be and how many more unfortunate victims there may be potentially? So, you know, where is the, the, the push, the, the urgency to really, you know, hone in and take care? And, and if yes, they, they violated, they may have broken the law, but a lot of them, you're still innocent until proven guilty, although they may, may be locked up and they are still human. They're so still where, human. where's the, 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 the proper nutrition, maybe health care if there is, uh, if there is a, a need for health care, mental care? I mean, you know, they are still, you know, do that, if yeah. you will. You're right. You're right. They are human nonetheless. That's right. That's, That's right. right. Well, a murder in Chicago claimed the life of a 28-year-old anti-violence worker just last week. Ronnie Roper was fatally shot in the head by two unidentified suspects around noon near the community center of gun violence prevention group in Chicago. CRED, the organization founded by former U.S. Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan, aims to tackle gun violence through education, outreach, therapy, and employment training. Roper had been with CRED for nine months and was working towards obtaining his high school diploma in 2023. The tragic incident has left the staff and Roper's family devastated, emphasizing the ongoing need for efforts to create a safer Chicago with economic opportunities for all. And I know Chicago has its, its concerns, most like other major cities and smaller cities across the country. You know, at what point I know the medical community has, you know, declared this as a national crisis, as an epidemic, as far as, you know, gun violence and people dying from 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 such horrific um, ways when it comes to guns. But at what point is this going to be like one of these politicians who's bidding for the presidency, uh, you know, or or other politicians looking to stay in office or get get in office? When is this going to be like a main platform, a main area of concern? It's an absolute, absolute epidemic. And it's not just Chicago. There was, you know, a, a myriad of reports that are just out saying, you know, listing some of the most dangerous mm -hmm. cities. We're talking about Birmingham, Mobile, St. Louis, Memphis, Baltimore. Usually um, Chicago is in that top 10, but Chicago's not at the very top, let's say top five. Um, so there are other major concerns yeah. across this country, you know, that directly affect the culture. And until somebody says, hey, this is an epidemic and it goes, they go about treating it and looking at it that way. Mm -hmm. 
I think we're going to continue to suffer. And it's a reminder of just how vicious this cycle of violence is. Mm -hmm. I just want to take a moment out, though, to salute the courage yeah. that this young man had. According to a statement by Cred, Roper had been with the program for the past nine months and he was working towards leaving behind the life on the streets and he was on his way to earning that high school diploma uh, when his life was cut short. And so this was somebody who had summoned the courage to do it differently, to break away from street life. And unfortunately, because of this vicious cycle of violence, mm -hmm. they would not let him uh, escape street life. Yeah. We're going to continue to uh, pray for that family and for the strength of really that organization. So let's move on here to a very dreadful day in the aftermath of the September 11, 2001 terrorist attack. An NYPD detective was injured while assisting in rescue efforts and collapsed at the collapsed towers. Uh, she endured multiple surgeries and suffered physical injuries and toxic exposure related to conditions. Now, despite being cer certified by the World Trade Center Health Program, she believes the Victim Compensation Fund has failed to compensate her adequately. She continues to live with debilitating injuries and PTSD, as you can imagine. Uh, cases of lawyers uh, misappropriating funds meant for victims, including African Americans exposed to toxic air, have come to light. The VCF was established to provide compensation, but some lawyers took advantage for personal gain. Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina has officially entered the 2024 presidential race. Scott, the Senate's only black Republican, filed paperwork with the Federal Elections Commission to seek his party's nomination. And for those of you who wonder if it's possible for a broken kid and a broken home to rise beyond their circumstances, the answer is yes. For those of you who wonder if America is a racist country, take a look at how people come together. All of God's people come together. His campaign aims to offer a more optimistic vision for America's future, challenging the dominance of partisan brawlers in recent years. As a deeply religious former insurance broker, Scott draws inspiration from his grandfather's work in the cotton fields, highlighting his rise from generational poverty as a testament to the American dream. Now stay tuned for Scott's formal announcement on Monday at his alma mater, Charleston Southern University. So from picking cotton to picking a seat in uh, uh, Congress, I think that's how he kind of coined that uh, mm -hmm. journey, if you will. Listen, you know, aside from his politics, which are a lot in line with, you know, some of the other uh, GOP members that we we may not care for as uh, soulmates or care for, depending on where you sit, what side of the aisle you sit. I, I enjoy hearing about his story. I was down in that region, so I was very familiar with the senator. And, uh, you know, you can't deny his story from very, very humble beginnings, you know, broken home. You know, he, he really laid it out yesterday. Um, he just threw me a little bit with, you know, suggesting that America wasn't a racist country. I, 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 you know, for me, uh, you know, I think this country was unfortunately built, you know, on racism and built on on the backs of, of, of natives and indigenous folks and people of, of color. So I kind of, you know, he can he went left a little bit with that uh, for me. But just as far as his story is concerned, I I, uh, I can appreciate it. The politics. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I think a lot of folks are responding, at least initially, to his personal biography, mm -hmm. which is a, mm -hmm. it's a compelling biography uh, for a lot of folks. You know, but, you know, he is, uh, uh, you know, a, the only black Republican in the Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, and his voting record uh, is pretty consistent with the Republican Party, which, you know, has been uh, pretty anti-black in the legislation that they have supported, mm -hmm. uh, has been, you know, pretty anti-LGBTQ, has gone over, gone after women's reproduction productive rights and so you know it, it's there's some people that say he, he's he's Trumpy with a smile right <laughs> uh, and uh, I think 
you know, time will tell. Time will only tell whether or not Republican voters in the primary sort we'll of take to that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, he's definitely somebody to watch. You said Trumpy with a smile. Trumpy with a smile. You, you better, Trumpy, Trumpy with a Kool-Aid smile. You better copyright them. I'm going to get that one from you. All right, let's move on here. An advocacy group is putting pressure on the University of Minnesota to scrap its internship program that only accepts applications from non-white students. The Equal Protection Project is demanding equal opportunities for all students regardless of their skin color. Uh, uh, president of the EPP called the program inexcusable and urged the university to open it up to students of all races. The controversial multicultural summer research opportunities program is facing criticism for its exclusive focus on students of color. The EPP has filed a federal civil rights complaint seeking an investigation into the university's practices. The University of Minnesota has yet to respond to the controversy. Oh, here we go again. It's another group that is really against affirmative action, mm -hmm. and they're 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 picking a fight yeah. uh, to try and, and declare their war, their continued war against affirmative action. Look, in the application, the program states that the purpose of the program is quote to prepare students of color and Native Americans for graduate school. That is what it states on the application. So I don't see how anybody could fill that out and turn it in and then be surprised, oh, we didn't get selected. Well, the program was not set up for you, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And these sorts of summer enrichment programs have made a huge difference. Very much uh, so. For folks that may be first-generation college students mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, across the board, first-generation graduate students, of course. And so uh, this is just more of the same. These yeah. are the anti-affirmative action folks mm -hmm. trying to pick a fight, uh, but it's right there on the application. I was gonna say, like, this program, along with a myriad of others, have been in place for years, and, and, and affirmative action, you're right, for me, first, you know, came to mind. I'm like, well, what's the difference between this program and other programs that are out there, that have been out there, that have been advantageous for students of color? To be more specific with this one, they receive $6,000 a $6, stipend that goes towards their personal and educational uh, matters to help them uh, along, you know, through their journey at the uh, University of Minnesota much like other universities and sometimes even high school at the high school level um, you know have so I couldn't understand what the fuss was I think it just has to do with where we are as a country right now and the rhetoric and the type of and the temperament of the conversation with erasion and all that other stuff and people are emboldened to say how they really really feel about these programs well they can be as emboldened to say what they want to say <laughs> but leave the leave these graduate students alone leave, mm -hmm. leave them alone let them have their research dollars Indeed. Uh, moving on to the University of Michigan where football staffer Glenn Shimmy Schembechler resigned after racist social media posts were discovered. Schembechler had recently been appointed as the assistant director of Michigan football recruiting. The offensive remarks and likes on his Twitter account prompted backlash and concerns. In a joint statement, head coach Jim Harabaugh and athletic director Ward Manuel acknowledged the pain caused and reiterated the university's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Shim Beckler issued an apology emphasizing the need for caution on social media and recognizing the ongoing injustices faced by the black community. You know, this was a big deal because his dad is Bo Black Beckler, who is just an, a legendary god, a football coach god, not only, uh, you know, in that field, but in particular at the University of Michigan. So it was very disappointing, but, you know, once he signed on, once they hired him, somebody was like, ah, 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 and did a little research. You know, when you put that thing out there in the universe, in particular uh, Twitterverse, uh, it does not disappear. Uh, uh, and so people found those past uh, comments, uh, which were pretty, pretty bad, pretty disgusting, if you ask me, to whereas if they just vetted him a little bit more, I mean, I know he's this uh, coach God's son, uh, but um, obviously he's on something that does not work for uh, the University of Michigan and pretty much for anybody else when you take a look at those comments, especially a Spartan. So. Yeah, and, and, and it's also a cautionary tale for all of our soulmates to mm -hmm. be mindful of your social media posts and not just what you're posting, but what are you liking? What are you retweeting? That's right. You know, when you retweet, retweet articles, do you actually read the article mm -hmm. or do you just retweet because you like the headline, mm -hmm. right? You know, because at the end of the day, you don't want to get caught up in a situation where you're up 
for a job or a promotion or some opportunity. And they pull that thing and up. And they pull that thing up. And, and they make they draw conclusions in terms of who you are and what you believe. Yeah, this next story here, I definitely drew a conclusion because I thought Carmelo Anthony had already retired, but now he has officially announced his retirement from basketball. Forgive me, Melo. Uh, the former Syracuse standout and 10 time NBA All Star retires as the ninth highest scorer in the league history with 28,289 points. Anthony, who was a part of the 75 greatest players in NBA history, has had a successful career, including winning an NCAA championship with Syracuse back in 03 and three Olympic gold medals with Team USA. NBA Commissioner Adam Silver praised Anthony's achievements and expects him to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Anthony looks forward to supporting his son's basketball journey as he enters the next chapter of his life. My goodness, I mean, 19 seasons, that's nothing to snuff at. Yeah. Um, you know, ni having 19 seasons anywhere mm -hmm. uh, is a major feat. And so, you know, salute to him. I mean, all great things come to an end. Yeah. You know, and then you move on to your next chapter and you do something else that's just as great, if not more. Yeah, I just thought he was already retired, but on the heels of this story comes, you know, LeBron and him kind of flirting with retirement. I think it's just that, a bit of a flirt. I don't think he's he's going anywhere uh, soon, but, you know, they got to beat down. Uh, they were swept by those Denver Nuggets, so uh, LeBron was just saying there was a lot to consider. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of retirement talk uh, today trending uh, in the news when it comes to the NBA, so we'll see how everything plays out. We shall see. All right. Well, coming up, the viral TikTok that taught thieves how to break into cars is costing two companies. We'll tell you how much Kia and Hyundai will have to cough up. You're watching Fox Soul's Black Report. Soulmates, we'll be right back. And we welcome you back to Fox Soul's Black Report. Organizers in Florida have canceled several Pride Month events due to new anti-LGBTQ laws signed uh, by Governor Ron DeSantis, you know it. That's right, the laws which include restrictions on gender affirming care for minors and bans on drag shows and restroom use based on gender identity have created a hostile climate for LGBTQ residents. Organizers cited concerns for the safety of participants as the reason for the cancellations. The NAACP has issued a travel advisory for Florida describing the state as quote, hostile to black Americans under DeSantis's leadership. Now, despite the setbacks, some organizations uh, like Lake City Pride have vowed to continue their fight for LGBTQ rights. I mean, it's a, it's a big question. I mean, on one hand, you know, we want to make sure that as leaders in our communities that we're doing everything we can to keep our communities safe. Mm -hmm. And so for the folks that said, you know what, we're gonna step back from Pride celebrations in, in uh, Florida until the temperature comes down, I get it. On the other hand, I understand groups like, you know, Lake City Pride, you know, who said, you know what, we're going to continue to have this, you know, and I think a lot of pride celebrations across the country are going to have to make that judgment for themselves based upon their assessment of safety on the ground. But this is where we're at in America, is that we cannot have a celebration of our communities, of who we are, of how far we've come for fear that some lone wolf for fear that you know, you know, some person who may, you know, be mentally not well, mm -hmm. may show up and not just interrupt the party, but uh, intend to harm people, mm -hmm. to commit acts of violence. This is where we're at in America, and the fact that Ron DeSantis is preparing to run for president of the United States, considering the hostile climate against LGBTQ folks I don't think he cares. and black folks and women in Florida? I don't think he cares because I think he is very justified in the way he feels in his platforms. And he's obviously very comfortable with Florida becoming the, the epicenter of, of chaos, confusion, uh, hostility, like you just mentioned, and the fact that he has just, you know, begun this tirade, if you will, of just undermining a, a whole culture as if our history does not belong, you know, in American history. He, I don't think he has a problem with it, which is why he continues to push on. Mm. Well, Hyundai Motor America and Kia America Incorporated, they've agreed to settle a $200 million class action lawsuit stemming from a viral TikTok challenge that exposed security flaws in their vehicles. Mm -hmm. The lawsuit was filed after TikTok users demonstrated how easily certain, 
how easily certain Kia and Hyundai models could be hotwired. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration reported multiple crashes and fatalities related to the instructional content. As a part of the settlement, the auto manufacturers will provide free software updates and anti-theft devices for eligible vehicles. The companies express their commitment to customer security and assisting those affected by car thefts. You know, I do think in the world that we live in that these uh, automotive manufacturers should be held responsible as they are in some respect, but also, you know, it's like we're living in this world where there has to be so much forethought. I mean, when you're designing this, be and by the way, Kia has some great cars, trucks in particular. That's a great don't, line. Don't sleep on Kia. I know. But do you have to design a car and say, you know what? Let me think that some, you know, idiots are going to try to hotwire. So maybe we should, you know, you just, you're just making a car, you know. And, I, and I, again, I understand the climate. I understand, you know, what we're living in. But who... Who has sometimes the forethought to think that on TikTok, you know, th this this method of stealing these cars was going to become just this phenomenon and people were going to suffer uh, as a result. So there's that. But I also feel like in some ways, you know, maybe they could have made the car a little bit more steel proof, if you will, especially with the ease. I mean, those TikTok videos were just they were unfortunate because, you know, a lot of people laughed at it and thought it was funny. But, you know, they're talking about car owners, people who are hard earned money to to, you know, afford a car and, and transportation. It was just unfortunate. You know, and it's just another reminder of all the information that's out there mm -hmm. on the Internet. You know, you could go on, on to the Internet, you can go on a TikTok and you can, you know, learn how to hotwire a car. You can go on and learn how to print a 3D gun. You can go on, you know, and do so many different yeah. things that, you know, can, can create harm for other people mm -hmm. and sometimes commit violence. And so, mm -hmm. you know, at some point you got to also ask yourself, what role do the social media companies have in terms of uh, monitoring the sort of content that can create that kind of harm. All right, so we're going to keep with TikTok for a moment as uh, they have filed a federal lawsuit against the state of Montana after it passed the law amid a banning the apt uh, app. The lawsuit argues that the ban infringes on free speech rights and amounts to censorship. TikTok's lawyers assert that national security concerns should be regulated at the federal level, not by individual states. The lawsuit seeks to overturn the Montana law before it goes into effect. Last week, TikTok creators filed the first challenge against the law, claiming it violates free speech rights. TikTok's Chinese ownership has raised concerns regarding data privacy and national security here in the U.S. I mean, you know, this is going to be a case for the ages because when's the last time you heard of, you know, any government, federal, state, or local, you know, acting to ban a social media platform. Mm -hmm. There are uh, uh, millions and millions and millions of Americans that are on TikTok, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and people want their TikTok. You know, you know, Listen. once folks have access to something, it's hard to pry it away. And so if this can happen with TikTok, imagine what could happen with other platforms. And so it's another example of why Congress is uh, moving too slow in terms of reforming any sort of reforms to our social media platforms when it comes to, uh, you know, protecting our free speech, but also being more aggressive at rooting out hate speech. I do believe that TikTok is being singled out because of the ownership and the ties uh, to China and the 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 relationship that we either do or don't have uh, with that uh, country. But listen, um, like you said, people want their TikTok. And I don't think this law goes into full effect until the top of the year. So that fighting is going to be ongoing. It'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. I don't know how many soulmates are in uh, Montana, but I know folks are going to raise up. They're going to raise up and save TikTok for themselves, especially, you know, the soulmates in Montana. All right, we depending on you soulmates in Montana. Are there soulmates in Montana? <laughs> sure, there's few. Uh, moving along, Alzheimer's disease has a greater impact on black Americans compared to white Americans, exposing healthcare disparities. Structural racism, limited access to quality care, and higher rates of risk factors contribute to the disparity. Black caregivers face challenges in advocating for their loved ones and encounter discrimination within the healthcare system. Lack of representation among healthcare professionals exacerbates the problem. The story of Constance Guthrie and her daughter Jessica sheds light 
on the struggle faced by black families dealing with Alzheimer's. Um, I certainly uh, have uh, friends mm -hmm. uh, that uh, are caregivers to loved ones with Alzheimer's. I've lost loved ones uh, to Alzheimer's. It is a terrible, terrible disease. Uh, the linkage between the effects of racism and Alzheimer's, you know, this is some compelling stuff. You know, and the question is, well, you know, as this body of research continues to grow, what are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, we've heard folks declare racism a public health emergency. Well, now look at this. You know, look at the relationship between, you know, racism and Alzheimer's. The question is, what are we going to do about it? I don't know. <laughs> to, to, to answer your question, I, and especially with me, I've never had any like personal experiences with this particular disease. Uh, for me, it's been you know experiencing uh, family members, maybe with dementia or friends, you know, family uh, friends uh, with family who are who are dealing with this disease. But it is so cruel in regards to the way it just robs the person of the person. You know, uh, my parents and, and grandparents on both sides ha have gone on to to be with the the ancestors in. In very different ways, but I could not imagine, you know, them not knowing, you know, who I was as they transitioned mm -hmm. or at the end of their time in with us in this dimension. It's just have to, it just has to be heartbreaking, especially how close I was with 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 all of them. Um, I don't know what what can be done, but but there's something that needs to be done because this these diseases are are ravishing us just as much as the cancers and the diabetes and the hypertension and so on and so forth. So. Yeah, we gotta take a look at it for mm -hmm. sure. And for all the people out there that say, oh, you know, racism, that's way in the past. You know, get over it. Nope, let's, let's, let's address it. How about that? Indeed. Still ahead, actor Idris Elba has a new project in the works. That's right, we'll tell you all about his new docu-series when we return. You're watching Fox Old Black Report. Welcome back to Fox Hills Black Report. Well, Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison, the top prosecutor who oversaw the Derek Chauvin trial, has written a memoir. His book entitled Break the Will, Ending the Cycle of Police Violence drops today, just two days ahead of the third anniversary of George Floyd's death on May 25th of 2020. Former officer Chauvin, uh, who is white, kneeled on the black man's neck for nine and a half minutes. A bystander video captured Floyd's fading cries of, I can't breathe. The events changed the world and amplified the need for police reform. Ellison said that he wrote the memoir because he wanted to provide a guide for other prosecutors and share the lessons his team learned about the difficulty of convicting police officers. A personal tie here, uh, Mr. Ellis is from uh, the area. I went to school, Michigan State University, with his uh, younger brother, so I'm kind of familiar with his rise, but I, I, I did not know that, uh, you know, his what he was doing in Minnesota prior to uh, the George Floyd case. And I remember seeing him at the press conferences and how, you know, eloquently and calmly he handled that situation because it was, again, all eyes were on America in particular Minnesota with just how this uh, case especially on video just played out yeah and I, I'm really excited about the potential impact this book can have mm -hmm. not just across the country among prosecutors particularly more progressive uh, prosecutors mm -hmm. but uh, folks around the world people around the world mm -hmm. were watching the Derek Chauvin trial they were watching the injustice uh, when, it, uh, when it came to the murder of, of George Floyd. And more importantly, they were watching, what is America gonna do about it? What are we gonna do differently? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I love that his, bo his book offers us some insights in terms of how do you, you know, uh, achieve a fair trial, right? But hold police officers accountable. It is one of the major questions, I believe, of our time. Sounds like we're gonna have to add it to our summer reading list. I think so. All right. Hopefully it won't end up on the book ban list. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Idris Elba and his wife, Sabrina Elba, are partnering with the BBC and the CBC to produce a three-part docuseries exploring how the music industry has notoriously exploited black artists. You don't say. This is all according to The Hollywood Reporter. Now, the Elba's documentary will center on the historic injustice black artists have uh, faced being denied their fair share of profits and recognition after black creatives drove the culture of popular music from jazz and rock and roll to soul and rap with their talents. The three partnered uh, entitled Paid in Full 
The battle for payback will also explore reparations for black artists. This is a very important conversation for us to have mm -hmm. and hat tip to Idris Elba and his wife, you know, for uh, being a part of leading that conversation. You know, look, you know, we know that there has been a tradition in our country mm -hmm. and particularly in, in the music industry where black folks have not gotten their due, have not been treated fairly, have been taken advantage of, you know, and that's not just something that happened way back when, it's something that's still happening now. Remember what Prince was fighting for? Mm -hmm. All those years where he went by the artist formerly known as? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, part of, the, part of that was an extension of some of the issues that Idris Elba and his wife are looking to explore. Yeah, and it's a, it's a pushback, um, you know, and it, uh, from the conversations that we've been having in this country, and I'm assuming, you know, across the pond as well, as far as blacks and the validity of our history and our culture. And so I'm sure this documentary will, like I, I like to say, lift the veil or reinstate, if you will, or really drive home the history and, and how we've always been, you know, uh, the creators of a lot of what has become mainstream uh, America and, and for the culture to tap back into that, because I don't necessarily listen to rock and roll, but you best believe uh, had it not been for black creatives, there would be no rock and roll in regards to how music, you know, formed uh, throughout uh, throughout the uh, years. And in terms ages, of ages, really. And, and in terms of building that generational wealth, we know that that intellectual property mm -hmm. is really important, mm -hmm. right? And so I would imagine there's going to be another area that they that they delve into. I mean, look at what we've reported on right here on Fox Soul's Black Report, where you know. Thanks to AI powered technology, you have what was it, The Weeknd, you know, and uh, Drake and mm -hmm. some other artists where tech not, this algorithm just sort of took advantage, you know, of uh, some of their lyrics or you know, some of the melodies of their songs, mm -hmm. created a new song. Yeah. And got a whole lot, lot more streams, right? And they didn't get a check for that. And so there are so many different uh, angles that the Elbas can take with this documentary series. I'm looking forward to watching. Sure. And it's not too far fetched. I mean, he's in the entertainment industry an actor but uh, Idris Elba is also a very well celebrated uh, DJ and musician so this is this is right up his his alley as they say so it'll be interesting to see how this all comes together easy on the eyes too yes he is <laughs> all right well <laughs> one of country music's pioneers DeFord Bailey will now have his legacy live on forever in Nashville Tennessee a street was named uh, recently after the Harmonica Wizard, the street now named DeFord Bailey Avenue, was dedicated in the Edge Hill neighborhood of Nashville, where Bailey grew up. Bailey's contributions to the music genre was often whitewashed or removed from history books. It wasn't until David Morton wrote the 1991 biography almost 20 years after Bailey's death that he was finally recognized as a musical pioneer. The Opry issued an official statement and apology for its role in the racism experienced in country music wow. in 2022. And, and they can keep issuing that apology, not only issuing the apology, but making sure the country music landscape is safe and fair for the uprising of all these new age country music artists. There are some bad brothers and sisters of color out here, up and down the country music charts. If you have not tapped in, I encourage you to do so. And uh, it's, it's really like a, oh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a full circle kind of a moment because I can only go as far back as maybe a Charlie Pride uh, and, and black country, but, but that was just such a, uh, he was such a, uh, isolated figure in the sense that you know you only knew about him maybe if you listen to country music or maybe if you found interest to delve a little bit into the history and the relationship between blacks and country music but again like I stated as, as, as someone who studied the evolution mm -hmm. of black music it all comes from us trust and believe all right we're gonna trust and believe you. <laughs> indeed all right now let's travel across the pond again where Buckingham Palace has declined to request uh, to return the remains of an Ethiopian prince who came to be buried at Windsor Castle. This happened back in the 19th century. Uh, the prince was taken to the UK uh, at age seven and arrived as an orphan after his mother died on the journey. Queen Victoria took an interest in him and arranged for his education and ultimately his burial when he died 
at uh, the young age of 18. Now, in a statement sent to the BBC, a Buckingham Palace spokesperson said removing his remains could affect others buried in the uh, tombs of St. George's Chapel. That's located in Windsor Castle. What say you, Nicola Corte? So then I think the question then becomes, so then what are you going to do? What are you going to do uh, in collaboration with and conjunction with uh, the Ethiopian so government uh, mm -hmm. to uh, to rectify right this? this. I mean, yeah. you know, this is a historical wrong. Um, we know that King Charles was just coronated, um, uh, and the question is, what is he going to do? He's now the king, you know, and and it's not enough to to you know put out these. Apology notes, and you know, I feel so bad about the history of slavery and the involvement of of uh, of, of the British monarchy. Right. The question then is, in the spirit of restorative justice, what are you going to do about it? Mm. And and the deafening silence in terms from Buckingham Palace answering that question, I think it speaks volumes. Um, I, I think the king is probably being ill-advised to sort of, you know, ignore this, this will go away. I don't think it's going to go away, and I don't think it should go away. This is definitely going to be on my uh, find out a little bit more about it Google search, because this is a, f a first for me actually learning about uh, this story, but I'm sure there may be, you know, plenty written about it. I don't know how honest or how much of a fairy tale um, play there might be on it when you, when you research and, and try to find the real deal, but maybe this spawn some sort of documentary by somebody who will really get down to the get down so you can get the real truth uh, and how this thing really really played out I was looking at this picture and he looked just so sad and 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 it, it just it for me it conjures up more interest as to the entirety of the story yeah if you take it from your homeland at seven years old I, I yeah. look sad too yeah all right well up next the writer strike uh, is continuing to impact creatives, especially black ones. When we come back, we'll speak to one of those writers about how this strike is forgetting our contributions to the industry. Hmm. You're watching Fox Soul's Black Report. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Fox Hole's Black Report. Well, black creatives are sounding the alarm during the national writer's strike. Yeah, they say their contributions have helped many companies, but they receive little to no acknowledgement or appreciation. Black writers say, also say the boost in diversity on streaming platforms is thanks to them, but instead of benefiting for the contributions, they are now worse off than ever before. And joining us now to discuss this more in depth is Hollywood screenwriter Tash Gray. Tash, welcome the Fox Souls Black Report. It's good to be here. It's good to have you here. Absolutely, absolutely. So Tash, first things first, tell us a little bit about you. How did you get started in the industry and what are some of the projects that you've worked on that our soulmates may or may not be so familiar with? Oh, they know. <laughs> <laughs> they know. <laughs> uh, I have been writing for a little over 10 years now um, and I have written for shows like Snowfall, Raising Canaan, um, Reasonable Doubt, Unsolved, The Murders of Biggie and Tupac, some comedies, Harlem um, is one of the ones I've consulted for. So I've written for hopefully some of your audience's favorites. So talk to us about how black writers uh, help boost that diversity in, in streaming. We'll, we'll tackle that conversation first, because especially during uh, the pandemic, uh, when there was just such a big need for content, you know, our material was really like front and center. And those numbers were big for, for black content. Um, yeah, I mean, what happened was, you know, we had a lot of time on our hands and we needed something to do. And so uh, the streamers took advantage of all of that content that we had already banked and they've been running and playing ever since. And, you know, what happens is, you know, the more things we consume, the more um, our appetite to consume mm -hmm. goes up. And since as um, a part of this black culture, we kind of set the trend and the waves and so forth. So, you know, most of the material from Snowfall to All American to Harlem, those shows were reviewed, you know, with much vivacious appetite. And as a result, more of those shows were being made as um, since 2020 or actually since 2017. Mm -hmm. Tash, uh, so 
bring us up to speed in terms of the latest with the strike. What, what are some of the long-term goals for the strike? And, and help our soulmates understand what's at stake for black riders uh, if uh, the WGA does not succeed in the strike. Well, I mean, what's at stake for all riders, specifically black riders, because, um, you know, the, the riding force still doesn't reflect our our community at large as far as the numbers. There are less black riders than there should be. But when um, studios come up for air and realize how much they money they've really lost, they're going to punish us all. And the first people fired are the last hired. So that will be a lot of black writers. Um, right now, it's about um, devaluing our, our product. You know, we're in an industry where we're the only thing that they make money off of. You know, 95% of media is who we're striking against. Like, we're striking against the, the TV networks, the studios, you know, all of those places you watch your lovely shows. That's who we're saying, hey, you can't make five billion dollars off of our product and then we can't even make a living where well, we have to work two and three jobs. And what happens is for black writers, we end up, you know, finding ourselves working on a show and also having another job and that's not sustainable and in five or ten years there'll be less black writers as a result because you can't have a family you can't live in los angeles which is required to write in this industry you just can't survive yeah, and you spoke on some of the you know misconceptions because prior to uh, this this particular strike, there there might be a whole generation of folks who who did not know that you all just weren't making enough to just sustain a basic living out there in one of the most expensive places to live, which is uh, California. Second jobs, uh, people falling behind on bills, they can't afford to properly feed and, and educate um, their children. Talk about you know some of those other misconceptions or any pushback that you all might have gotten uh, for this strike? Well, you know, the industry will tell you, any any big company will tell you, we can't afford to do this. You know, we can't afford to give you a dollar more. And then you look at their quarter earnings and you're like, but your, your CEO made 60 million and hmm. your worker can't make minimum wage. That that doesn't, that's, that's, that's inequity. That don't make sense. Mm -hmm. That's not going to so we have to, you know, come together and stand up. You know, most people think, oh, writers are, you know, there are some writers that have mansions, but they, they're, not, they're not us. They're not the majority. There's 7,000 writers who are basically saying, look, we're barely able to survive. There may be 100 that have mansions, but that's not the vast majority. We all know that, you know, 1% has all the wealth. And that has moved over the years, you know, where the the middle class has declined and that's all that writers are saying is we just want a sustainable life we want to have this as a career and it's not so much for me as it is for the next generation because mm -hmm. five ten years from now mm -hmm. this won't be a sustainable living so we have to come together and it's it's solidarity you mm -hmm. know it's not just about writers this is about the workforce we're all fighting to you know, have a sustainable lives from teachers to truck drivers to all of us. You know, we want to be able to live and not just be making everyone else rich while we're you know mm -hmm. can't afford to buy eggs. I was just well, thinking well, the same. The yeah. same. Th listening to Tash, I was just thinking the same thing. Like everybody is in a fight, no matter yeah. what lane you are in. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of fighting going out there. But I just want to pick up on something you said about solidarity. And we know that just this past weekend at Boston University, there were a number of, of graduates, you know, that responded to David Zaslav, the CEO of, of Warner, uh, while he was giving the commencement address and said, pay your writers, mm -hmm. pay your writers. He started chanting and drowned him yeah. out while he was delivering a speech. At, in terms of acts of solidarity, you know, what can we do? What can our soulmates do uh, to, to help uh, our black writers yeah. who are in, you know, the fight for their very future and the fight for the kind of content that we enjoy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I saw that video and it warmed my heart. I was like, okay, we might be all right with this next generation because a lot of them may even want to be writers. They're like, there won't be a job for us in five to 10 years because they'll use AI to replace us. And I think that's one of the biggest problems black 
um, um, writers are going to have is they're going to try to, I mean, their appropriation is already rampant, but they're now going to use machines to appropriate us and then get rid of us. And I, and that's a problem. So in order to really have your voices be heard, you know, you could do it the grassroots way like they did at Boston University and use your platforms to say you support writers, pay your writers, WGA strong as hashtags. You can also donate to the um, entertainment fund, um, which a lot of us will have to go to because depending on how long we're on strike, we're not getting paid. Like we're out. It's been three weeks. You know, we're in week four right now. And that's no money. So a lot of it is just let your voices be heard. And if you know any writer, you know, tell them you stand with them. If you don't know a writer, find one and tell them you stand with them, especially yeah. black writers, because we will be the one most impacted when this strike ends. No doubt. There's about no that. doubt. Yeah. Yeah. Our, a lot of our soulmates are standing with yeah. you. And so thank you for joining us. Yeah, Tash Gray, thank, thank you so you. very much. Uh, we are definitely uh, with you. And stay uh, encouraged and inspired because we, we need you in what you do, and we appreciate you. We'll definitely have you back to follow up and see how things play out. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Indeed. Brazilian soccer player Vinicius Jr. is speaking out against racism in Spain. Junior faced racist chants during a game leading to a 10 minute stoppage and his dismissal from the field. Taking to Twitter, he criticized La Liga, stating that racism is normalized in the Spanish Professional Soccer League. Junior called out Spain as a country known for racism. In response, La Liga President Javier Tebeas Medrano defended their effort to combat racism, but was met with Junior urging him to take real action. Junior emphasized the need for punishments, not just hashtags. And back here stateside, super agent Rich Paul is celebrating the 10th year anniversary of Clutch Sports Group, the sports agency he founded. In an interview, Paul confirmed that Clutch has negotiated over $2 billion in contracts for their clients. He discussed building the brand on a recent episode of Rap Radar. Paul's career began working under sports agent uh, Leon Rose, representing basketball superstar LeBron James. He started Clutch Sports Agency and now represents over 120 clients, including NBA stars Draymond Green, Anthony Davis, and Trey Young. Clutch recently negotiated the richest contract in the NFL history uh, for quarterback Jalen Hurts. It always seems impossible yeah, until it's until done. Until it's done. Yeah, they, they've been on one for a while now, and it is a fantastic story. And if you don't know the backstory to it, Google it. Google it. That's right. <laughs> Up next, it's our favorite segment, Black Excellence, and we're highlighting education. Yeah, we're going to go into details about the accomplishments of a custodian in Georgia when we return. You're watching Fox Hills Black Report. All right, it's time for Black Excellence. Our a school <laughs> custodian from Clarkston, Georgia, goes back to school at age 45 to earn his high school diploma. Elmo Da Silva earned his diploma after years of working as a school custodian at a local elementary school and had been aspiring to become the head custodian, but it required him to have a high school diploma. Now, the school's principal encouraged him to enroll in the DeKalb County uh, Adult Education Program. After nearly six months of night classes, Da Silva Re, uh, received his diploma at a graduation ceremony organized by the school district. Now with a high school diploma, De Silva has the opportunity to be promoted to head custodian and potentially open doors to further professional growth. We love to see it. And it is never you. too late. Yeah. Uh, we celebrate you, brother. We do. And just the, the article also talked about, the report also talked about how, you know, this, this, this enhances his life, not only for him, but his family and what he might be able to aspire to now that he has his high school diploma. It might encourage him to go on and, mm -hmm. and, and further you know, along his uh, education. So there's like this trickle out effect. And if he, you know, he has children and how that would influence them to just stick and stay with mm -hmm. something until you finish. Stick and stay with you something. Finish. You know, one of the things I oftentimes say to my my nephews and my nieces is finish what you start. Yeah. And and because when you finish what you start, it's contagious. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's the kind of contagion that we want to spread across that's generations. Right. And that's so right. uh, it's great to see him get his high school diploma. Keep going, brother. Keep going. That's Keep right. Going. 
All right, speaking of keeping going, a former teen mom and her son graduated together from Georgia State University. That's right, India Thomas said that she went through a difficult period when she discovered that she was pregnant at age 17. Her family did not support her decision to keep the child, and she ended up living in a homeless shelter. Instead of losing hope, Thomas used her difficult circumstance as a motivation for success. She later managed to secure a good job that offered tuition reimbursement and enrolled in classes at Georgia State University. So Thomas was able to inspire her son, Camus, to enroll at the university while she was attending classes there. She earned her bachelor's degree while her son earned an associate's degree. And he was in that dual program where you can get college credits when, you, when you're in high school. Mm -hmm. And so they ended up uh, two different ceremonies, but graduated on the same weekend. I think that's awesome. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, a true family affair. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's really great. It's really great. And again, it's never too late. And, you know, students and uh, graduates look all sorts of different ways, right? Mm -hmm. And so there are traditional students and there are non traditional students, right? And so for our soulmates that are watching, mm -hmm. that, you know, maybe haven't finished that high school diploma, maybe haven't finished that bachelor's Use this degree as or whatever, you know, I hope that you feel a sense of inspiration yeah. today. And to those who have finished, we are in the midst of graduation season. Congratulations to you. God bless you on whatever journey you, uh, you know, choose for yourself. It is a great feat. So I know there's a lot going on in the world, but take a moment to celebrate yourself. That's right. And for the full rundown on today's stories and more, you can access Fox Souls video on demand on any of our partners. You can even access past shows and other black centered content. And don't forget to download the Fox Soul app. It is free. I'm Courtney Hicks. And I'm the Cordelai Corte. On behalf of the entire team here at Fox Souls Black Report, stay lifted. And stay safe. We'll see you again tomorrow. Bye. <laughs> what? <laughs>